Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. When we first hear that a person has gone missing, our imaginations for most of us run wild. What could have happened to this person? Where are they now? Are they still alive? In this case, the truth is far wilder than our imaginations could ever have dreamt. I first heard about this case many years ago, when it seemed that all leads had dried up. My Google searches came up with nothing for years and years. That is until February 2017. But let's start at the beginning. This is the story of Tara Grinstead. On October 22, 2005, the beloved high school history teacher Tara and ex-beauty queen has a house full of girls. She's helping them get ready for the Miss Sweet Potato pageant. At 5pm, they head to a neighbouring town of Fitzgerald, which is about a 15 minute drive. And there she watches the pageant. Around 7pm, she then leaves the pageant and goes to the house of Rhett Roberts, her landlord's son. At 8pm, she then makes her way to the house of Troy Davis, who is a workmate, and he lives about eight blocks away from Tara's own home in Osceola. She spends several hours at this cookout, and friends say that she was in a good mood. Tara then receives a phone call while she's at this cookout. The police have yet to confirm who the phone call was from and what the phone call was about. She tells her friends at the cookout she's going home to watch the video of the pageant. At 11pm, Troy Davis walks Tara to her car. And for many years, this is the last known sighting of Tara Grinstead. Tara Faye Grinstead was born on the 14th of November 1974 in Hawkinsville, Georgia. She had humble beginnings, her single mother brought her up, and at school she was said to be popular, sweet and very pretty. But although Tara was pretty, her goal was always education. She wanted to be a teacher. So once she graduated, she took herself off to middle Georgia College. From there, she ticked off goal after goal. In 1998, when Tara was 28, she got her dream job as an 11th grade history school teacher at Irwin County High School. This was in Osceola, which is a very small town of just about, about 3,000 people. And it's around about an hour's drive from her hometown of Hawkinsville. Tara was very busy as a high school teacher, but through all this, she managed to get her master's degree five years later and she had another passion on the side. While Tara was studying, she was also entering beauty pageants. She was a talented singer, so she used this at her advantage. Tara won the title of Miss Tifton more than once, and she eventually moved on to state level, entering the Miss Georgia pageant. But it wasn't vanity that drew Tara to these competitions. She was a smart cookie and she knew that she could use her winnings from these competitions to go towards her education. And that's exactly what she did. Grinstead graduated from Middle Georgia College in 2003. She earned her master's degree in education at Valdosta State University. Tara was of course very busy working as a full-time high school teacher, but she also had part-time jobs too. She would coach girls in these pageants, helping them with their wardrobe presentation, and she also worked part-time at a beauty counter in a department store. She was a very busy girl. So it all seemed that things were going great for Tara, but unfortunately this wouldn't last long. When Tara didn't show up to work at Irwin County High School on the Monday, which is just a few days after she was last seen at the cookout Saturday night, her co-workers instantly called the police and reported her missing. The police went to her home where she lived alone. The front door was locked and all that they found was missing were her purse and her keys. They said that there were no signs of forced entry, 
but they did find a few strange things. Just a few feet from her front door was a discarded blue latex glove. They also realised that her bedside lamp had been broken. Tara was also reportedly very close to her neighbours, the Portiers. Joe Portier told CNN that Tara had a system with them. When she returned home at night, she would turn on her bedroom lamp to let them know that she was home safe and sound. The night of her disappearance, she may have returned home at later than the Portier's usual bedtime because they actually reported not seeing any light, which they said wasn't unusual for the weekend. Billy Hancock, Chief of Police, noticed all Tara's personal effects were untouched, except her purse and her keys. They couldn't explain the blue latex glove or business card found wedged in her front door. The police didn't release to the public at first the broken bedside light and the unusual pushback position of the driver's seat of Tara's car and mud on the tyres. Irwin County High School Principal Bobby Connor was quoted by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution as saying, we're a small community and this has really touched home because it is something you read about happening elsewhere. This is someone with a tremendous magnetic personality and the kids just love her. When the word got out that Tara had gone missing, people instantly sprang into action. Students started making flyers and the Tara Grinstead Command Centre was established. People were looking on foot, on horseback, vehicles, swamps, fields, everywhere was searched by volunteers, but nothing was found. As the search for Tara continued, anguish in her small community of Osilla grew. Investigators interviewed over 100 people, turning Tara's disappearance into one of the largest missing persons cases in the state's history. They even offered a $100,000 reward, but that yielded no results. And as the days turned to months, and the months grew to years, Tara's family and friends were left to wonder what had happened to her. So through work and her social life, many people knew Tara. But she was not just a teacher, she was a mentor to many of the younger female students. And I would say that perhaps some of the male students could have had crushes on her. So while many people envied her, others may have wanted to get close to her. And this made the case quite difficult for the police. Tara's ex-boyfriend, Marcus Harper, was a top suspect until he was cleared. They'd had a six-year, very stormy relationship. Tara had in fact loved Marcus. Her friends and family said that she adored him and in fact wanted to marry him. But it's alleged that Marcus didn't want to commit at that point in time, so they went their separate ways. Tara had in fact seen Marcus only one week before she disappeared. She was distraught because Marcus had failed to tell her he was in town. She turned up at his house visibly upset and even threatened suicide. A frequent visitor to Tara's home was said to be family friend Heath Dykes. It was alleged that the two of them had had an affair. Heath was married and an ex-cop and it was later found out that he was the person who had left the business card in Tara's door. The rumour mill really began to crank up in Osilla. Some people believed that Tara was being stalked by perhaps a jealous ex or a jealous girlfriend. Others thought that someone right under their noses could have been the suspect. Many students had crushes on Tara and in fact an ex-student Anthony Vickers believed he had a real life relationship with Tara. Heath Dykes was actually at Tara's home when Anthony turned up at her door, banging and screaming to be let in. And then that turned into insults. Tara ended up having to call the police and in her report she said that she was scared for her safety. I don't know if Anthony was ever charged with anything. And as far as I know, Anthony didn't bother Tara again after this. Tara's friend Wendy McFarlane said that she was the kind of person who would have opened the door to a student. If they were in need, she would have let them in. Mm -hmm. 
So it seemed at this point Tara's case had gone cold, no further leads. But there was a glimmer of hope. In 2008, the CBS show 48 Hours did a special on Tara's case, and it was revealed that male DNA had been found in that latex glove. According to an interview with Gary Rothwell of the GBI, he said, we believe it is a critical element to solving the case. Over the course of the investigation, he said agents have compared the DNA to dozens of men who knew Grinstead or who were associated with her. None of them are a match. Rothwell said the DNA also had been entered into the Georgia and national databases, but still no matches were found. Eventually, despite the investigators continued search, Tara was finally pronounced legally dead. The town of Osceola was devastated. Not long after the CBS's 48 hour special on Tara, a very strange occurrence happened. In February of 2009, a YouTuber laid out an interactive game. He alluded to the fact that he was a serial killer and that Tara had been one of his victims. It was later to found out to be a hoax. Two years later, and Tara's case still seems to have no progress. Gary Rothwell does say though, that Tara's case is not cold. He says that they're still receiving leads every day almost, and every one of those leads is being followed up on. Even more years pass. In February 10th, 2015, authorities trawl a pond in Ben Hill County, finding some objects that they never identified. Eleven years after Tara's disappearance, there were still no strong leads. However, interest in her case was still strong, even though she was pronounced dead. On the 7th of August 2016, Atlanta filmmaker Payne Lindsay released his first episode of the podcast Up and Vanished, which was about Tara's case. Payne Lindsay was from Georgia and he wanted to cover a case that was from near where he grew up and he was drawn to Tara's case. It seemed solvable, but there seemed to be no leads. Why? Officials and media were actually crediting Payne's podcast for igniting interest in the case and perhaps even leading to a suspect getting arrested. But Payne's investigation may have never even started if it wasn't for Dr. Morris Godwin seeing his post on the website WebSleuths. Dr. Morris Godwin had been working on Tara's case as a private investigator since 2006. He was employed by Tara's sister Anita to look into her case only a few months after Tara had gone missing. He was willing to share everything he had on what was the largest case file in Georgia history. He shared evidence he found in her house all those months later and was openly critical of the GBI's investigation, ranking it a 3 out of 10. Dr. Goldwyn also offered one critical piece of advice. He said, if you go to Osceola, take someone else with you now. It's a weird place. And then bombshell moment. Dr. Goldwyn said he had found signs of a disturbance in Tara's home. He said that her phone had been found on the floor in her bathroom. He said that the lamp was in fact broken, that objects on a table had been knocked off center, the alarm clock had at one stage been unplugged and then put back into the, the plug and was now under the bed. And her clothes had been found strewn on the floor. Now in some cases, for some people, that would not be strange. But in Tara's case, it was. She was extremely proud of her clothing. It was very out of character for her just to leave her clothes on the floor. And another sign that Tara hadn't just upped and left, her dog Dolly Madison and her beloved cat were left alone. In the initial search of Tara's house, investigators found beads from a broken necklace. But when Dr. Morris Godwin searched Tara's house later on, he found the clasp of the necklace, which appeared to have been broken by force. 
In addition to this, Dr. Goblin also found pieces of broken plastic from Tara's headboard. It appeared that the bedpost was split in two and broken. Dr. Maurice Godwin has a theory about how the perpetrators got inside. He doesn't believe that it was forced entry with the credit card. He thinks that Tara definitely knew the perpetrator or perpetrators and just simply let them in. Or she could have been perhaps distracted, somehow left the front door open and that's how they got in. He also thinks the crime was sexually motivated. We all have secrets. Sometimes we trust someone enough to share these secrets. Although Tara seemed to have this perfect life, she was dealing with emotional turmoil. At the time of her disappearance, people close to her confirmed she was mending a broken heart. It's believed Tara had found out her ex-boyfriend Marcus Harper was now seeing a younger woman. Tara was not taking the news well as her altercation with Marcus at his house a week before her disappearance will prove. I have been concerned with some opinions expressed by the public and even some media sources implying Tara was promiscuous. It's never actually been proven that Tara was having a physical relationship with either Anthony Vickers or Heath Dykes or any of her ex-students. Her relationships can't be a source of condemnation, but I can see how they could affect the investigation. The more people close to Tara, the more people needing to be ruled out. So for the people following Payne Lindsay's Up and Vanish podcast, and just following the case in general, the tension was rising. There was definitely people out there who had an idea of what may have happened to Tara. But were they rumours or were they fact? In some of the earlier episodes of Up and Vanished, people had mentioned that they thought that Tara's body had ended up in a pecan grove. But these were just whispers. Then in February 2017, this case was blown wide open. A witness came forward, like many before her, with leads on the Tara Grinstead case but this time it was different. It could have been another red herring, but Brooke Sheridan told investigators a man named Ryan Duke had killed Tara. Suddenly everybody wanted to see who this man was that had killed the beloved Tara. Quickly images of a scruffy looking, shameful Ryan Alexander Duke were splashed all over the media. But who was he? And more to the point, who was he to Tara? About three years before her disappearance, Ryan Duke had attended Irwin County High School. People were shocked to find out that Ryan had been arrested. An old high school friend said he was a good friend. He was a really nice guy. You never expect. Never in a million years. Tara's friend Wendy McFarlane said she was shocked when Ryan was arrested. She said Ryan was a nice, respectable kid from a good family. DNA had linked Ryan to the latex glove. That's right. The DNA on the blue latex glove on Tara's front doorstep belonged to Ryan. Then on February 23rd, 2017, the GBI held a press conference to announce that they had arrested Ryan Alexander Duke. Until Brooks' tip-off, Ryan had apparently never been on the GBI's radar. During his court hearing on February 23rd, Ryan was officially charged with burglary, aggravated assault, murder, and concealing a death. On the Up and Vanish podcast, Payne Lindsay interviewed an unidentified friend of Ryan Duke's. This friend went on to reiterate that Ryan just didn't seem to be the type of guy that was capable of murder. But this source also brought up another name that came up in the rumour mill. And this name was initially bleeped out as it was an ongoing case. This person said there's no way he did that himself. He wasn't a dumb guy, but he wasn't sophisticated. The source said right after she disappeared, a couple of weeks after, there was a party and this kid was talking, eavesdrop. 
he was talking about having killed Tara and dropped her body in a pecan orchard in Fitzgerald. According to attorneys for Duke, a motion was filed in August 2018 to have all but the murder charges against them dropped, given that it took more than a decade for police to arrest them. To add more weight to this story, the police were apparently looking for someone around the same age as Ryan, an accomplice, someone who may have helped him. On March 3rd, 2017, the police arrested Bo Dukes. Yes, very similar surname, but no relation to Ryan. This was the person whose name was originally bleeped out of the podcast. An old friend had described the pair as a package duo. Bo was charged with tampering with evidence, concealing a death and hindering the apprehension of a criminal. The grandson of a former state representative, Newt Hudson, and another former student of Tara's, Bo's family happened to own the Pecan Grove in Fitzgerald. Tara's friend Wendy McFarlane is also Bo Duke's cousin. She says the Pecan Orchard is sacred ground. The fact Bo has been involved in this murder is dragging down their family name. So do Bo and Ryan have previous criminal convictions? Well, looking at Ryan, the only thing we can really see is a DUI from 2010. Bo, on the other hand, is a bit more interesting, or some could say a bit scary. He's been described as volatile. He was a former United States Army unit supply specialist, and he was sentenced to three years in prison after he and his then wife, Emily, pled guilty to stealing more than $150,000 from the United States Army. And it gets more interesting. Before his arrest in 2017, he was spending time on the up and vanished discussion boards. Writing anonymously, he continued to speak out online following his arrest when he posted bail. And at the same time, he violated the court ordered gag order. And to highlight Bo's stint on the Up and Vanished discussion board, he also had several private conversations where he would answer their questions and literally laid out his narrative of the crime. So you must be thinking, what is the motive? How did Tara end up meeting up with either Bo or Ryan or both of them the night of the 22nd of October 2005? How did their paths cross and what happened? Bo said that the night Tara had gone missing, he was asleep at home where Ryan Duke was also living at the time. He said the next day Ryan told him that he'd gotten high, broken into Tara's house to steal money for drugs and had hit her, accidentally killing her. Then he had used Bo's truck to take Tara's body to a pecan orchard that was owned by Bo's family. Bo claimed he didn't believe Ryan at first until he saw Tara was reported missing on Monday. Later that week on Wednesday, Bo says Ryan took him to the pecan orchard and showed him Tara's body. Bo described what her body looked like. He said she was nude. He saw no jewellery other than a belly button ring. He said she was covered in ants. He said he saw no blood or wounds on her body other than marks around her neck. He also mentioned the discoloration in her skin. He thought the marks looked more like they were caused by hands rather than a ligature. At this point, Bo says he helped Ryan move Tara's body into the back of Bo's truck so they could take it to a more hidden place in the orchard. He said he grabbed Tara's body by her arms and Ryan grabbed her legs and this is how they carried her. They moved her elsewhere in the pecan orchard. Then Bo says it was his idea to get wood and cover the body and burn it. He said they hauled four or five truckloads worth of wood to the body site and covered her up so much that you could no longer see any part of her body underneath. They then began to burn it. Bo said it took two days to burn the body and that they checked on it the next day, Thursday, and it had been burnt down to just bones. He described seeing nothing but bones by then, no flesh, and that it might have been rib bones. Bo said that Ryan had never given him a reason for killing Tara. 
but that even though part of Ryan's story was that he'd broken into Tara's home to rob her by using a plastic card to slide into the door and shift the locks open, he also told Bo he had gotten into bed with Tara and had ended up strangling her. Bo also made a statement that Ryan told him he hadn't worn gloves, yet the latex glove was found in Tara's yard. And just before you think the story can't go even more pear-shaped, the anonymous tipster that turned in Ryan Duke also just happens to be Bo Duke's girlfriend, Brooke Sheridan. When Brooke asked Bo why he helped Ryan and didn't go to the police, he said Ryan threatened him. According to Bo, Ryan said to him, it's your truck, it's your family's land. You'll look guilty. Now this is completely alleged. I don't know if this is true or not. I'm hoping this will all be cleared up once the court case has happened. But some people believe that there was a bit of a plan concocted by Brooke and Bo in order to receive the reward money for information on Tara's case. According to a source, I think the plan was to turn him in, let the other guy take the fall, meaning Ryan, and then Bo would admit to his part in it and take a plea deal so he doesn't serve any time. And then they would all get their share of the reward money. Now remember I said that Ryan had never been on the police radar and it was a huge shock when they found his DNA on the latex glove. Well, Payne also uncovered a bit of a bombshell there as well. 12 years earlier, there had been an investigation on the pecan orchard. There was a tip from a friend of Bo and Ryan's come forward to the local police station. Bo had told someone at the party one night that they had killed Tara and disposed of the body. They had basically confessed, telling several people over the years about what had happened. It was taken to the police and it was never followed up. Why? So if Bo and Ryan both confessed, then it must be an open and closed case, surely? Well, not so fast, because there is a problem with Ryan's confession. Ryan's friend, Zach Jared, says that Ryan has actually told law enforcement three different stories. And on top of this, Ryan's mother also admitted to Payne Lindsay that Ryan suffers from bad anxiety. When he was taken in for questioning by the police, he had taken two strong painkillers. Duke recanted his confession to the GBI, blaming his admission on the drugs he took. He said, quote, I'm not going to sit here and say I did something I didn't do. On the 4th of May 2017, Ryan Duke pleads not guilty. An interesting theory that was brought up in the Up and Vanish podcast was how Tara may have bumped into either Ryan or Bo or both of them. Some people believe that the phone call she received while at the cookout was from Marcus and he was at a local bar. Some people think that Tara went straight from the cookout to this bar looking for Marcus and while she was there perhaps she had an interaction with these younger men. So what could be other possible motives and theories on why Tara was murdered? Supporters of Ryan Dukes believe jealousy could be one of the motives. In 2005, Ryan was a good looking guy. He was an athlete. I'm pretty sure he would have got his fair share of female admirers. Bo Dukes on the other hand, well he may have resented this. It's been speculated that Tara may have dated Ryan around the time of her disappearance. Again, it's never been confirmed, but this could explain why Ryan 
or Bo were at her house. It's also alleged that Ryan was a heavy drinker around this time in 2005. Ryan also was known to drink to the point where he blacked out. Is it possible he hurt Tara and can't remember? Or another theory could be someone took advantage of Ryan's blackouts and made him believe he was the killer. Another curious thing to note is the mud on Tara's tyres. Did she go somewhere after the barbecue? To meet someone or a group of people? Did the murder occur elsewhere and then the killer staged the break-in at Tara's home? Attorney Ashley Merchant had heard about Ryan's case. She was so interested in helping Ryan as she believed that his part in Tara's murder was far less than what Bo was making out. She believed wholeheartedly that he deserved a fair trial. So on the 27th of August 2018, Ashley announces that she will now represent Ryan Duke pro bono. Ashley Merchant then files motions to change the venue and request a private investigator. This is so, again, that Ryan will get a fair trial. Ashley Merchant said during a February bond hearing that the entire case was built on an inconsistent statement from someone who was under the influence of drugs. We've got the wrong person in custody, Judge. It's the wrong person. On the 18th of December 2018, Ryan Duke's confession was leaked onto the internet. In Ryan's confession, a very interesting point is that he made a phone call from a payphone to Tara's house a few hours after the attack. He said he did this because he wanted to see if Tara was still alive. He wanted so badly for her to answer the phone, but she didn't. Now that was of interest to the police because they knew about that phone call and only the killer would have known that it took place. According to the confession, Duke said that he went back to Tara's house to remove her body. He claimed that he wrapped her body in a blanket and placed it in the back of a truck that belonged to his friend Bo Dukes. Two sources connected with the case believe that Bo Dukes is behind the leak of this confession. Now what's curious here? is there are witnesses that have come forward to say they saw a black truck parked outside Tara's house on the weekend that she disappeared. There were three sightings of this truck early Sunday and then another early Monday morning. One witness's car almost got hit by this black truck on West Polk Street around midnight on the Saturday. Now what's really odd about this is that people say that Bo's truck is a white pickup. So who does this black truck belong to? So by 2019, this had become a real case of pointing the finger. Ryan and Bo head to head saying that the other one did it. Ryan was now claiming that on the night of the 22nd and the 23rd of 2005, he was at home with his brother Stephen and also his flatmate roommates Bo Dukes and Ben McMahon. According to the alibi motion, Duke says that he and his brother fell asleep and never left the house. He says Bo and a friend named Ben McMahon are the ones who left the house that night. Incidentally, Ben McMahon died in 2014. Bo Dukes was due in court in March of this year for lying to the GBI and concealing her body and not coming forward to the police. But uh, before then, in a very crazy turn of events, he was charged with the abduction and rape of two women on New Year's Day. Uh, this apparently happened in Macon, Georgia. Uh, there was CCTV of the women fleeing this house that Bo had taken them to. Bo then fled and went into hiding. After a four-day manhunt, he was caught at a relative's house in Osceola. But if there was ever any argument that Bo was capable of violence against women especially, geez, I think that may answer that question. 
On the 21st of March 2019, Bo Dukes's court trial started. District Attorney for the Cordell Circuit, Brad Rigby, started his opening statement by giving the jury gruesome details of the disposal of Tara's body. A daughter, a sister, a teacher, a cheerleading coach, a pageant queen, Rigby said. She invested her life in others. But Rigby made sure to make one thing clear. We're not here to try Dukes for Tara's murder. He went on to say the case was not about the murder, but about Bo's lies. Lies that lasted from 2005 to 2016. A lot of people also speculated whether Bo's uh, powerful and wealthy family were covering up for him. How could they not know that a body had been disposed of on their land? Well, Bo's uncle, Randy Hudson, testified that his nephew made bonfires on the Pecan Orchard back in 2005 and he didn't like it, but he said that he never tried to cover up for him. Now remember I said that the GBI claimed that Bo and Ryan were never on their radar. Well, retired GBI special agent in charge Gary Rothwell took to the stand during Bo's trial. Rothwell testified that Bo and Ryan's names were mentioned in 2005 in the Irwin County Sheriff's Office report and again in 2008 in an interview with the GBI. However, those leads were never followed up on. Rothwell took full responsibility. He said he thought it was something the local police departments had already looked into. Forensic anthropologist for the GBI, Dr. Alice Gooding, testified that burnt fragments of human bones were found in the orchard. She confirmed that the human remains were found at a site excavated on February 28, 2017. Pictures were shown to the court of hand fragments, skull fragments, fragments from the spine and even a tooth that were found in the site. Gooding explained she could tell the bones were burnt because of their bluish grey colour and their weight. Although DNA tests are yet to done, so they can't say if it is in fact Tara's remains or not. Also, blood was said to have been found on Tara's bed comforter. Again, it has not been confirmed whether this is Tara's blood or whether it has anything to do with this case, but again, very compelling evidence. What's quite amazing about this case is the trial took only four days. For such a high profile case of this nature too, I believe that's extremely fast. And it also only took the jury one hour to deliberate. Chastine sentenced Bo to the maximum sentence of 25 years for lying to the GBI and concealing Tara's death. When handing down the sentence to Bo, Judge Chastine mentioned that Bo had several opportunities to come clean about his part in Tara's murder. He said, quote, I just can't quite get my head around what was done. You were an adult, 21 years old, when this happened. Tara's sister, Anita Gattis, said that she was relieved when the verdict was handed down. She said, quote, we finally got a little bit of justice for Tara. I know we have two more trials to go, and I hope we get the same verdict in those two. But I was very thankful that the jury actually saw the truth. Anne Bo still faces charges in Ben Hill County for allegedly burning Tara's body and in Houston County for the alleged sexual assault of the two women at gunpoint. Now at this stage when Bo's trial happened in March 2019, Ryan had said that he was pleading not guilty and he used his brother Stephen as his alibi. Remember I said that the four of them were hanging out and he said that he was at the trailer the whole time, he never left, whereas Bo and his friends did. Now during Bo's trial, Stephen actually said that he couldn't remember 
whether Ryan left this trailer or not, which is crushing, I think, for Ryan's case because this basically blows his alibi. So the latest in the Ryan Duke trial was announced on June the 10th, 2019. In a unanimous decision, the court declined to hear a pre-trial appeal that asked whether Duke was wrongly denied funds to hire an expert witness which challenges the forensic evidence that will be used against him. There have been whispers that the trace evidence or DNA found on the latex glove was very minimal and in fact I'm wondering here if that's what they're talking about in this instance but again it's that's just alleged. Now Duke had been represented by a public defender until his attorneys Ashley and John Merchant stepped in. The issue at play here is whether Duke should still be able to get public funding even though he's being represented pro bono or for free. Ryan's defence attorney Ashley Merchant says that when you have to try a case twice because the first trial is not constitutionally fair, she said it helps no one, it's just a waste of taxpayer money. So some people believe that Ryan's court case may not even take place till 2020. One of Tara's good friends, Maria Harbour, believes that Ryan did kill her and that Bo helped. She has been haunted with the fact that she never knew what happened to Tara for so long and she said she was not able to mourn the loss of her friend until over 10 years later. She remembers her friend Tara fondly, the late nights talking about boys and writing love letters, the road trips they took when they couldn't even afford the petrol to get from one place to the other, and the fact that Tara was so giving she would always buy her gifts and one of her favourite things to do was buy her Barbie dolls as a bit of a, a joke um, because she knew that Maria loved Barbie dolls. So it's now a waiting game to find out if we will ever find the truth about what happened to Tara, the real truth. Some of the experts believe that the real truth will never come out and that we'll only get some kind of version from Ryan and Bo. I will of course be filming a follow-up video once Ryan's court case has happened. Thanks for watching, stay safe.